I'm Paul Sullivan, your host on the Company of Dads podcast, where we explore the sweet, sublime, strange, and silly aspects of being a lead dad in a world where men, who are the primary parents, often feel they have to hide or at least not talk about their roles. One thing I know from personal experience is being a lead dad is not a traditional role for men, whether you work full-time, part-time, or devote all your time to your family. Parenting is so often left to mothers or paid caregivers. But here at the Company of Dads, our goal is to shake all that off and create a community for fathers who are lead dads and to welcome other dads who want to learn from them. Today, my guest is Michael Cohn, an attorney better known as Mike, so as not to be confused with that other Michael Cohn, the attorney. Mike is a partner in the law firm of Dwayne Morris in Philadelphia. He's also a lead dad to his two daughters, one in high school, the other in college. His wife is a director for a national nonprofit. Mike's specialty is employment law, which is particularly relevant for fathers who want to take time off or just be more present as dads. Now, not everyone can be a lead dad, but most every father wants to be there. Can that be done without impacting a man's career? And can we have true gender equity without men feeling they can have greater flexibility at work? I think we're going to have some great lessons here coming out of COVID today. So Mike, welcome to the Company of Dads podcast. Paul, thank you so much. It is so nice to be here and so great to talk to you. You know, your kids are, are, are a bit older, you know, you, you, they, you kind of had this 20 year or so span as a, as a lead dad. How yeah. important was it for you to be present in their lives throughout and, and how'd you balance that with work? It, it was everything for me, really starting from uh, even before uh, me and Maddie were born. Me as my 19 uh, year old and Maddie is my 15 year old. Uh, I used to joke with my wife, Jamie, all the time. I used to tell her, I was like, like, I'm good at very few things. Um, and the thing that I know I'm going to be really, really good at is being a dad. So like, let's get this thing going. Um, and from very early on, and, and when my older daughter was born, um, I was just a few years out of law school. So I was working the kinds of hours that a lot of people work in big law firms. Uh, and I didn't want ever to lose any kind of connection with my girls. Uh, that was of paramount importance then as it is now. And you have to sort of, I sort of carved my own path at that point in terms of this, the establishment of hours and expectations. And I really did my best while still working very hard uh, not to lose ever the contact and, and the feel for, for my girls. You know, as an employment attorney, is it is it safe to say that you had a generous paternity leave and you know, lots of flexibility when you became a dad, was it easy for you to go and talk to the senior partners and say, Hey, uh, I need some time off. It was incredibly not. <laughs> um, yeah. So look, we're going back, as I said, roughly 20 years ago at this point, uh, at a time where, uh, interestingly, I actually started to write an article at the time called the myth of, uh, paternity leave, uh, because organizations would talk about it and the importance of it. But if you really took it in equal parts to the mom, I think it's fairly safe to say it was frowned upon. Whether it was done out loud or expressly, um, I, I think you were looked at differently if you were right from the jump a lead dad or somebody who really did take incredibly seriously mm. that work-life balance. I don't want to make a light of this because it's a super serious subject. But yeah. like, isn't it a tad bit ironic that the employment attorney um, wasn't able to have more flexibility at work? It sure it is. Yeah, absolutely. And and look, the reality is we've evolved. Um, uh, organizations are better at recognizing the importance of dual parenting, yeah. of yeah. the fact that there are plenty of dads out there who are lead dads, who are wildly um, involved parents who don't take on the the gender roles that existed right like madman madman not a thing anymore right. um dads want to be involved and and one of the benefits i actually have given the kind of work that i do is i have the ability to have conversations with organizations who are formulating policies who are changing policies and talk to them about my personal experiences and other uh, personal uh, experiences that, that friends of mine colleagues of mine have had uh, to really try and impact the way they are creating policy that will affect the men that work inside of their workplaces. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you know, a 50 some odd, uh, 50 something, uh, partner, uh, in a law firm now, 
what is the, you know, how do you look at those, you know, 30 something uh, associates who, who might come to you uh, and say, Hey, Mike, <clears throat> you know, uh, not even my, my, I, I'm, I'm a new dad that that's become acceptable, but uh, you know, my seven-year-old uh, really needs me today and I need to get out early to go do this. But, you know, I can imagine the people then kind of hemming and hawing, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get back online tonight and I'll finish this. How is that conversation that you have with them differ from the conversations that that partner had with you all those years ago, or, or that you you perceive that partner would have those conversations with you years ago. So let me answer that by sharing a, a very brief anecdote, if you don't mind. Um, I rem recall when uh, Jamie was pregnant with Mia, so we're going back 20 years or so, I shared my excitement with a couple of partners inside my firm at the point I, I was not made partner yet. Um, and they talked to me about experiences they had as new parents and talking about all of the things that they missed. And it occurred to me after I left their offices that they weren't complaining. It was almost as though it were a badge of honor yeah. that they, as I, a, I was so dedicated to the firm. And I mean, this is the toxic connection between masculinity and, yeah. and money that I, I'm going to go out there and I'm not going to be there. And it doesn't have to be that way. Particularly one of the things that we've learned, thank heavens over the course of the last couple of years is the reality that absent a time crunch on something, things can get done when things get done. That is not unique to the law firm industry. I think that is fairly widespread. So back to your, your, your question, when the dad with a seven-year-old asks, you know, for my help, for my advice, for my thoughts, again, there, there are times where it's unavoidable. There are times where if there's a court filing, if there's something that has to be delivered by five, there are some things that you just can't avoid. And, and that's, again, not unique to the legal industry. Outside of that, my response is go be with your family. Mm -hmm. If you get back online later tonight, that's great. Um, you know, these, what is it? The, the word emergency doesn't mean what most people think it means. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. So my, my response is family first. It always has been. It always will be. Um, I happen to work in a firm and in a department where that kind of idea is fairly pervasive. Uh, does that say that there are not exceptions? No, there are. So, you know, Mike, I remember you telling me sports were, were big for you. Yeah. How, talk, talk to me about how you made time to be in, involved with, with what your, your girls did and, and, you know, help them, you know, be part of that team as, as a coach. Yeah. So sports is big in our household. Uh, I was a baseball player. My wife was a D1 tennis player. Uh, sports has been a big part of both of my daughter's upbringing. And one of the things that I have been so unbelievably blessed to have is two daughters who want me to coach. Um, that is not always the case when you are, and I check in with them before every season. Sure, this is something you still want me to do. No pressure at all. I'm happy to take a step back. No, dad, we want you to do it, which, are, which is music to my ears every year. Um, and that was something that became very important to me when I established my schedule. I know that there are certain times of the year as a softball coach that are going to be busier than others. I know there are certain times of day that are going to be busier than others. So if that means that I've got to get up at four o'clock in the morning to get stuff done to so that I know that come three, yeah. um, I can get to Maddie's game because I know she's pitching that day. I could, when M Mia was playing, I know I could get to Mia's game because something was going to happen in that game the coaching has given me such a wonderful opportunity to connect um, in such a special way with my girls. And, and it doesn't happen as much on the field uh, because as a coach, you have to be the coach to everybody on the field. Right. Um, it's the car rides. It's yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and that to me is, is everything when, uh, so my older daughter has always been a competitive athlete. My younger daughter likes it, doesn't love it to the degree that my older daughter did. And I wasn't sure that after my older daughter, as we like to say, quoting Serena, evolved from soft, evolved away from softball, um, I, I wasn't sure whether Maddie was going to want me to continue to coach her travel program, if she was going to even continue to play. And I started writing again, that this is what I do when I have thoughts. I just sit down at my computer and I start writing. Um, and it was the, it was something called enjoy the ride. And it was all about the car rides, which of course was a metaphor oh, yeah. for enjoy the experience, be present in all of it, the good, the bad, and the otherwise. And 
sports has given me such a, just a wonderful opportunity to connect with my girls in a way that I, I just don't think I otherwise would have had. Oh, you, you know, hear everything in the car. You hear everything, not just everything. about what they're thinking, but yeah. what their friends are doing, what the interactions are. I, I love it. You know, when I you know, take one of my daughters somewhere and her, her friend, I have you know, three daughters, their, their friends are in the car. And because yeah. then I just, you know, I turn the radio on so they think I'm not listening. So it's on, right. you know, softly enough. But then it's because they're talking about oh, so-and-so did this or so-and-so did that. Or can you believe this? And it's amazing insight that, you know, we wouldn't get otherwise. Because otherwise it's like, how was your day? Good. But I think it's implicit cool. in that, implicit in that, Paul, is that your daughter trusts you. Mm. Because if she didn't, look, they're not stupid. They know, notwithstanding the fact that the radio is on four. <laughs> um, they know you're listening. They know you're there. And if the relationship didn't exist and the trust wor weren't there, you better believe your daughter would shut those conversations down. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, so my older daughter is a sophomore at Michigan. Go blue. And we had parents weekend last weekend. And I had one of the most wonderful experiences, not because of parents weekend wasn't great. It was, uh, my wife and I went to a tailgate for her sorority uh -huh. at, you know, 945 on Saturday morning because the game was at noon. And I, I'd met a few of her friends, but I hadn't met a lot of the young women in, in her sorority. And every person I met, every young woman I met came up, coach Mike, coach Mike. It's so great to meet you because my 19 year old daughter still calls me coach Mike, which I wear <laughs> such a, not, not dad, not coach dad. No, it's coach Mike. coach Mike. And it's such a term of, it's become such a term of endearment for me. Yeah. Um, and to have all of these women whom I've never met before come running, coach Mike, coach Mike. It was, just, it was very sweet. And it was a reminder of the impact. The impact. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Let's, this is wonderful. Uh, let's switch from the personal to the professional. Uh, sure. You as a, you know, an employment attorney coming out of COVID, where are, where are companies when it comes to employment policies? I mean, we saw that, you know, we all learned that most white collar workers could work remotely and, you know, figure things out, but you know, I'm going to guess that employment policy maybe hasn't caught up yet, but where, where are we now? Where are we with employment policy as it relates to people wanting to be human, wanting to be dads and moms? And I think we're getting better. Um, I think COVID I really do. I think COVID has taught us um, generally uh, the impact of being more present with family has become. Uh, and I think organizations really are the ones that are successful, the ones that are retaining employees in the era of the great resignation, where a lot of organizations who aren't doing things right really are hemorrhaging mm -hmm. um, staff, hemorrhaging employees. Um, the ones that are doing it right who have recognized over the course of the last couple of years, the importance of things like empathy, the importance of things like mental health awareness, the importance of the ability to interact with your family, even though you're home. And sometimes you feel even more disconnected because you're home. Right. Um, and, and one of those areas, uh, and I'll, you know, beat you to the punch a little bit, I think is the impact it's had on paternity leave, you know, back to the conversation we started to have, at the beginning and what we're starting to see organizations really start to get is dads are way way more involved mm -hmm. today than they were 20 years ago when i started to become a dad certainly more uh involved than they were 50 years ago when i was born uh and you know whether it is in the creation of leave policies that don't really create a distinction between the amount of leave a parent can get following the birth of a child, irrespective of whether you're mom or whether you're dad, mm -hmm. um, whether it's something my firm recently has done. And it's, it's incredible. It is such a wonderful step forward is they've created these ramp up and ramp down periods pre and post birth. And it applies to mom and to dad mm. or to both moms or to both dads. Uh, and the idea being that you can, in the four weeks leading up to the time birth is going to happen, you can ramp down. We understand that you as right. a parent are going to have to pay attention to some things that you've never had to pay and attention to. Not even you as a parent, you, you as a human being. I mean, there are biological sure. changes that are happening in your body. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, the biologic, biological changes may not be happening to me as a dad, but it means they certainly are happening. I'm in a, an opposite sex relationship, certainly happening 
to my wife. Right. And I have to not only be there for her, but certainly take on even more responsibility at that point. So this ramp down period, it really is such a wonderful idea where you can decrease the, your efficiency, decrease your output. And then for the three months following the birth of the child, it's the ramp back up period, recognizing right. again, we have these needs as parents following the birth of the child, as to your point, Paul, as humans following the birth of the child to get back up to where it is we actually do need to be. I mean, I see this. I think, you know, we can all agree that um, depending on your point of view, either the United States is woefully backward when it comes to paternity policy, or uh, everybody uh, could use maternity and paternity leave at some significant rate. And I'm not going to debate whether or not three months is long enough, six months. Sure. That's the move. But you know, as you know, your your girls are you know t- late teenage teenager and late teenager. Um, but things happen when they're ten. Things happen when they're. 13. And, you know, I did a podcast a couple months ago with Dana Seskin, who wrote a great book called Parent Nation. And she talks about her, her husband that, who passed away, but the husband was the father of her children, famous surgeon uh, in Chicago, and used to have to put into his calendar, you know, meeting with so and so chairman of the XYZ department when what he was really doing was going to his kids' soccer game. And he got, he got called out one day. Now, I think yeah. most of us can put that in our calendar going to ballet, going to soccer. Yeah. Fine. But that's not, you know, sometimes your child just, need you sometimes you, yep. your child needs you to sit with her or him for an hour or take a walk and how does that factor in like when people say you know oh, my 10 year old needs me i need to go to this oh are you going to an open house are you going to ballet like no i'm, I'm not i'm just she's having trouble at school whatever how does that has covid had any impact on that again we're talking about humans here and, and, and yeah. problems that happen. I, I think it has um what we're seeing and, and i'm not going to say massively but what we're seeing to some degree is we're going to some organizations going towards an unlimited pto kind of policy um and and it's interesting because the organizations that have gone that way report huge successes in terms of productivity um what we're seeing is organizations requiring employees to take certain amounts of pto recognizing that it will help them clear their own heads and people who work and work and work and work eventually yeah. burn out, eventually fatigue. Um, the reason I mentioned those is sort of a backdrop in answer to your question is I think the more flexible we can be recognizing that parents have these responsibilities and these are real responsibilities. It's not an official event to go to a recital, to go to a game, to go to mm-hmm. a parent teacher conference. Um, these are the, to your point, Paul, you know, my kid's having a tough day. Right. Or my, my kid needs help with some stuff, whatever that stuff happens to be at the moment. And, and the more we can say to that employee, to that colleague, go take care of it. I got your back. Again, is it always possible? It's not. Right. But it's certainly more possible or plausible or feasible than I think sometimes people actually believe it to be. Okay. The more humanity we can express and demonstrate the better off we are one of, one of my favorite quotes and i'm going to botch it so i'm not going to try and get it exactly right it's from robin williams um who's somebody who obviously grappled with mental illness throughout yeah. the entirety of his life uh, and, and effectively what he said was the more we understand that everybody we come into contact with on a day-to-day basis is dealing with something we don't know about the better off we're all going to be everybody's got stuff Right. Um, And the more flexible we can be, certainly as it relates to this conversation with regard to kids, uh, with regard to parenting, the better off we're going to be. And and the more loyalty you then engender in your employee, which means they're going to stay and they're going to work hard. Little bits of effort on your. I always say that instead of giving them an extra five grand, 10 grand, everybody wants more money, give them, you know, the not just you know, the, the 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 days to do this, but like the feeling that they can actually take those days. I mean, I've seen some companies when the person is on PTO that you get the email saying I'm on PTO until the such and such a date and I am not going to read your emails. Yep. So if you would, if this is urgent, just contact me, you know, in a week when I'm back, which I think is remarkable because otherwise you take time off and then you're inundated with all these emails. And most organizations are built as teams, aren't they? Right. So none of us is indispensable. <laughs> no, none of us is the only person absent maybe that surgeon that you were talking about but none of us is the none of us is the only person who can do the thing that needs to get done right. and if it is then you've built a team that doesn't function 
the way it's supposed right, to Then you have a broader management issue. Of course you do, which means somebody else got you. And if somebody else doesn't got you, right. Yeah, I think we've got a, we've got a failure in a team. So legally, I mean, what can a dad or mom for that matter ask for and what can they not ask for? What what is, you know, totally acceptable and what is, you know, beyond? It's going to depend on the culture of the organization. And I know that sounds like kind of a lousy answer. Uh, look, there are certain that, that that is a lousy answer, Mike. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. And let's let's let me give you, <laughs> you some concrete. That, let me give you something concrete. There are certain <laughs> things to which we are entitled um, as parents um, for birth of a child, for placement of a child in foster as a foster parent, or adoption under the Federal Family Medical Leave Act. Assuming that you've worked 12 months leading up to the date you need to leave, 1,250 hours leading up to the date you need to leave, and you have 50 or more employees within 75 miles, the employee is entitled to 12 weeks of job-protected unpaid benefit continued leave. You heard me say unpaid, which is to say the federal law does not require payment for that kind of leave. There are states right. that require payment uh, for portions of it. Um, there are organizations, and we're seeing it with increased frequency these days, that are... Uh, paying not as part of PTO, but as part of this, a separate bank are paying employees when they go out on this kind of paternity, maternity, parental leave. Uh, yeah. So what should an employee ask for? What they can get. Yeah, but right. that comes back to the fear. You know, we always say like in an ideal world, you know, the, the partner at your law firm or the, you know, senior person, line manager, whatever, would would have his or her schedule as an open book and then you'd be able to see oh wow you know she's actually taking or he's actually taking time to go and you know be with his or her daughter or son oh i guess i can do that we have to lead by example and so you may be entitled for, for something but some people are afraid and they're afraid yes. because it could cost them a promotion but we're talking the white collar world in the blue collar world it could cost them their job or or it'll certainly cost them an hourly wage and is there is there any movement? I know you said some certain states are doing this, but is there any movement again to sort of, you know, trust employees and incentivize their humanity for the hope that they will remain loyal and long term be better workers if short term they're not present? The answer is there is some, right. Paul. There are some jurisdictions, some states. Nothing really meaningful at federal level. Um, there are some states that are again mandating paid time off for parental leave. There are states that. Um, and cities that mandate, believe it or not, time off to attend parent-teacher conferences. Hmm. Um, there are not many. There are right. very, very few. Uh, but what it, what it comes down to, and, and again, this is where I see my role as, as a counselor as opposed to a lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, is encouraging organizations to recognize that the better they are to their employees in these times that are more fraught with stress, more fraught with yeah. difficulty. Um, overwhelmingly, the more loyalty we're going to build and the more productive employee we're going to have. Again, very, very small investment for very, very large return. Um, and that math works out pretty easily, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you always want a big return for a small investment? And it's what the evolved managers and organizations really are starting to understand. Um, and and well, what let me you, ask you that, though. Yeah. You, as, as you said, as a and a, as a counselor, not as a, an attorney, as a counselor who goes in and you're creating these plans, you're creating mm -hmm. a lot, correct? A lot of these lead plans. So as a counselor, you're allowed to, to, you're obligated to ask the tough questions like, are is this really what you want? Or are yeah. you sure this is what you want? Or if you do this, it will have these consequences, good or bad. How have the questions that you're asking around those issues change in 2022 from from 2019 they are much much more focused on mental health right now mm -hmm. um <clears throat> recognizing that as parents we we are all all dealing with issues the likes of which we had not dealt prior to 2020 uh, look if you have a child for example who has an underlying mental health concern that in all likelihood over the course of the last couple of years has been exacerbated sure um covid did and has continued to do a number on all of us, but kids particularly with underlying uh, mental health, with underlying mental health concerns. So are we making sure that we're giving our employees the flexibility to take care of themselves for sure, but in addition to take care of those people for whom they have responsibility? 
kids, parents, uh, you know, uh, adult parents, those kinds of things. So uh, the questions I'm asking now are are even more sort of people centric and people focused and mm-hmm. empathy focused than they were even a few years ago. I, I always like to think that that was something that I really held on to. Um, I'm the product of two shrinks. Uh, <laughs> my parents are both psychologists. They're incredibly divorced. Um, but, you know, I was made, it was made very clear to me at a very young age, you know, that what's going on between the ears and, and in your heart and, yeah. and it is just so critically important to your day-to-day existence. So I've always viewed that as my role. Um, we're finally getting to a point where organizations are paying a lot more attention to it than they had in the past in the form of, for example, back to what, what you asked earlier, in the form of, of paid sick time that's going to apply to an illness of your kid. They don't have to do that under most circumstances, but they're, the evolved organizations are not taking that away from an employee's PTO, but they're saying, here's some extra time. We know that you're going to have to deal with this. So here's some extra time you may need to take away from work. That's fine. Yeah. And I'm also thinking from like an equity point of view, we have, this isn't, you know, the company of dads doesn't, it's the company of dads, it's not the company of old people, but I would say that this, it means um, certainly some companies are also probably extending similar uh, policies to people who have to care, care for their own parents as their parents age and and struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, for me, the more of those provisions we can create and allow for our employees the better they're going to be to us in the long run. Yeah. Again, it's not complicated math. If it were, I wouldn't understand it. <laughs> uh, this is pretty basic stuff. Small investment, huge return. Why not? Yeah. What are you waiting for? Mike Cohn, thank you for being my guest on the Company of Dads podcast today. One last question. Sure. Uh, it's prediction time. Uh, I'm not going to ask you what the workplace is going to look like next year because it'll probably be just as much in disarray as it is this year. But you you go out five years and you look at, you know, the companies that are the leaders in their space, the companies that are pulling employees from from other firms that are less involved. What are those companies going to look like from the perspective of how they treat, you know, working dads and, and working moms? We will continue to blur and hopefully at some point completely eliminate the, the distinction between what moms get versus what dads get. Uh, Look, we can't eliminate that distinction as it relates, for example, to short-term disability payments for a mom who was just given birth. Dad's not going to be entitled to that. But in terms of the amount of leave, whether it's paid, whether it's not, uh, recognizing that most families these days are dual parenting families, right? This isn't we're not living in the Cleaver household. This is 2022. And if we're talking about 2027, what we're going to see is organizations that have adopted and have embraced notions like paid family leave Mm -hmm. uh, because they understand that it, again, it's a very short term and small benefit for a very potentially large return. Uh, We're going to, we're going to get the, the flexibility that we understood we had to have and create during the pandemic the organizations that are continuing with that level of flexibility are the ones that we're seeing retaining their employees and therefore retaining productivity and therefore increasing profits Um, and and just creating this loyalty and sense of retention. Um, And by the way, when you have happy employees, it makes it an awful lot easier to recruit more people inside of your organization. So I think what we're going to see, generally speaking, is this increased uh, tolerance or bad word what we're going to see is an increased embracing of flexibility at work, whatever at work looks like, whether at work is me in my basement, like I am right now, or you in a room that's way cooler than my basement, or it means I'm back at work, but there's more flexibility being provided to me while I'm actually in the workplace itself. I think generally that's what I'm, I'm hopeful we're going to see. Look, you think of how much you know progress we've made. It's, it's twenty years, but from when you first became a lead dad to now, um, and so hopefully, if, if you know, some sometimes good things come out of bad things, like like COVID. So hopefully, this sure. serves as an accelerator for change. Um, Mike Cohen, again, thank you for being my guest on the Company of Dads podcast. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks, Paul. It was really my pleasure. <laughs>